<laughs> I love it. <laughs> it's a brand new feature. <laughs> Welcome everybody. My name is Mina Jane. I'm the director of the Ashland Public Library and I'm really thrilled to be here with Kristen Higgins, who is one of my favorite authors. And I know we're going to have this fabulous conversation today about all of her books from Pack Up the Moon all the way back to Fool's Rush In. Yep. So this is a very interactive program. So please, please, please put your um, questions in the chat and we'll um, you know, we'll be responding to them. This is also live on Facebook. We'll be taking questions there as well. Before I get started completely, I want to let you know that you can buy any of Kristen's books from signed by Bookplate from Bank Square Books. And I'll put the link in the chat for everybody to um to access that because yes. you know, so I think signed books are gold. <laughs> and independent bookstores are gold. You don't want to live in a world where you know, you can only buy from one giant online retailer <laughs> or a mega store. So support your local indies. <laughs> um, okay, so great. Um, so Kristen, I told you I had a bunch of questions for yes. you. And, Fire away. Uh, okay, all right, all right. Um, which of all of your books do you remember enjoying writing the most? Uh, Enjoyed. Okay. Yes, that's actually a really easy question. Back when I was young, um, mm. before publishing turned me into this cynical, um, you know, wizened old person, I I had written Fool's Russian, which was my first book, and it that was a joy. Um, but the next book I wrote was even better, and it was funny because I got a contract, a uh, two book deal from Harlequin for my already written Fool's Russian, and I had no idea that I was going to get a, another contract. I was like, I thought I was one and done. And so um, I, I had to write another book and I had nothing. And this is a refrain that I say a lot. Nothing will be as good as my last book. So back then I was like, nothing will be as good as my first book. That means I should hang up my hat now. Um, so I was trying to think of a, of a romance and I, I was driving up to Cape Cod to my cousin's wedding. Hi, Bridget. Great wedding. And um, and our cousin is a priest and he was marrying her and he drove past me like we were, you know, cruising along 195. And I looked over and I was like, oh, hi, Barry. And he waved back. And my cousin is very good looking, <laughs> very good looking priest. And I thought, what if my heroine was in love with a priest? You know, the the total off limits um, aspect of that, you know, it would be so hard for her. And so what she can't obviously marry the priest, that's not the kind of book I was going to write. So I thought, and so, you know, let's make it really hard for her to find a guy. So I'll put her in a tiny little town way, way up on the coast of Maine. And the hero will be like the complete opposite of this cheerful, outgoing priest, like my cousin, Barry. And <laughs> So I got, I got to our house on the Cape and I wrote down like, she's in love with the priest and the hero is barely speaks and he's a lobster man. And I wrote that book in like eight weeks. It was Ooh. just, it was so easy and fun. I had not done a plot like that before. Um, you know, I'd only written one plot. So, so everything was new. And, um, and I also had a little bit of confidence because my first book um, was, was doing well and, you know, well-received and everything. So I'm like, Oh, it just flew out of my fingertips. It was so much fun to write. So and every book since then has been harder. <laughs> <laughs> Dang it. <laughs> well, I have to say that catch of the day is probably my very, very favorite book mm -hmm. by you. Um, Maggie, oh, Maggie. <laughs> <laughs> so I am going to say that, um, I'll jump ahead of my questions because Maggie was somebody who I loved, loved, loved so much. But I also thought, is she, is she like kind of a sucker? Are people using her? And is that why Malone was like, like, you know, get a, get a backbone kind of yeah. thing. Stop being so nice to me. Right. Stop doing, stop making me your project. Yeah. Right? <clears throat> and he, um, he sees it a long time before she does, but yeah, she is that person who always wants to, you know, be good, do good, make people like her. 
very much like myself, um, has a hard time saying no. And, um, you know, I, I liked that Malone is the only person who says like, I don't need anything from you other than you. Although that's a long sentence for Malone. He doesn't actually say that. <laughs> um, <laughs> but um, yeah, Maggie is, is a little bit gullible and, um, you know, very kind and very sweet and very straightforward. So it was, she was an easy character to write. Mm -hmm. um, well, she was super successful from my, my perspective. Um, so which of your characters is most like you? Well, um, my husband says that uh, Lauren in Pack Up the Moon is the most like me, which is why reading the book broke him um, mm -hmm. into many little pieces. It was awful. You know, I love watching my husband read my books. He only reads them when they come out. And, you know, this book is, is sad in that Lauren dies and we know that right away. And he was a ruined man. He was like, oh, honey, she's just so much like you. And I, you know, I picture you. And, and it, so he was, he was destroyed. <laughs> and then when he finished it, he was like, honey, this is a masterpiece. It's, you're, you know, it's so good. And, um, but I really had to, um, you know, I had to think really hard about Lauren because she's the first character I've ever written who knows that she's going to die a lot sooner than she had hoped. Mm -hmm. And so she has to prepare for the end. And so I, in some ways I had to get into her head more deeply than other characters because her time on earth is finite. The clock is ticking. And it was a whole exploration of like, how do you want to live the rest of your days? How do you want to be remembered? And how do you want to take care of the people you're going to leave behind? And, um, and I think because I had to think of those big questions, in a lot of ways, I was very much like her. The other character that I would say is a lot like me is Callie from All I Ever Wanted. Um, really? Her grandfather, I was very close with my grandfather, um, spent a lot of time with him, stayed with him. And I, um, I really loved like that dysfunctional, fun, family you know where the parents the mom wouldn't speak to the dad but that didn't stop her from coming to family dinners you know mm -hmm. and and the brother was like uh, you know smoking weed off on the side and and the sister was um you know very unusual as well um so I loved that kind of goofy weird but wonderful family and and I really related to Callie um and you know just like she's very honest um, you know, when the new hot single vet comes to town, she pretends her dog has a problem and goes to the to the vet and in the waiting room sees a lot of single women, you know, <laughs> her pets. And she's like, okay, so I'm not exactly original here. Um, and so I liked that about her that she was so willing to admit like she really needed to get over her boss and and so best thing for her, find somebody else single guy in town, I'm there, you know. <laughs> I love Callie. I, I love everything about that story. It's like they're meet cute, which wasn't so cute. <laughs> <laughs> the idea for that book came, um, so Callie is, um, she has a little breakdown at, in the Department of Motor Vehicles, which is, you know, the grimmest, saddest place on earth. And she's waiting in line to renew her license. And it's sunk home, um, her, the boss she works for, um, whom she loves is engaged to someone else. And she's on the phone with her sister and she's just sobbing and saying like, but why we were so happy. I don't understand. And that actually happened. I witnessed that um, when I was coming back from New York on a train, there was this young woman sitting across from me, you know, those seats that face each other. And it was rush hour train and um, and she was on the phone with her boyfriend and she was like, but I thought we loved each other and I just, I don't understand. We were so happy. And I was, you know, older and wiser as a mother. And I'm like, hang up, hang up, honey. And the call, stop, stop. And then I was handing her tissues like, you know, so she could wipe her eyes. And I thought, what a great way to start a book is like a whole bunch of people witnessing your worst moment, your heartbreak when you have no pride and you're just, you know, begging the universe for a reason. And 
And I thought like this poor girl and also, thank you. <laughs> thank you for being so unfiltered. <laughs> I feel like you're like murder she wrote only with romance. <laughs> So funny. Um, Denise, I see you're unmuted. Did you want to ask a question? Because I have a ton of them. I'm ready to go. Um, okay. So I'm going to go back to um, the ideas that you have about your books, because mm -hmm. um, the first time I met you, you had just written now that you mention it. And I will tell you that the first time I met Kristen, I think I cried. <laughs> she walked into the library and I was just like, oh my God, it's Kristen. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> I know. And you came in with like a posse full of people. You just had dinner with them. And I was just like, how do I get on that train? <laughs> and now we have dinner together once in a while. So. We do. <laughs> um, but you had said that that was a really interesting start of your story. Um, now that you mention it, because you had you tell it because it's a much better story, but I remember that so distinctly. I don't remember it, Mina. <laughs> <laughs> Give me a hint. What did I say? Okay. All right. So you were talking to somebody who um, her husband had cheated on her. Oh, yes. Okay. So that's actually on second thought. Oh, on second thought. Sorry. Okay. I, that's I, why I, I couldn't remember. So, um, yeah, so uh, I was, I had gone to see that Oscar nominated film, Critical Darling Magic Mike <laughs> <laughs> with my girlfriends. And I was feeling very elated and, you know, giggly. And we, we went to Chili's or something afterwards. And I got there first and I was sitting in the foyer waiting for my, my gal pals. And, um, and this woman sat down to me next to me and I'm like, hi, how are you? I just saw Magic Mike, it was so good, you know? Um, and she said, my husband is having an affair. And I always thought that this would be the line in the sand, but now that the moment is here, I don't know what to do. And I was like, <laughs> you know, go on. <laughs> tell me more and I was I was very you know very compassionate to her as, as a person I'm like oh my god I'm so sorry what a shock and and um how are you holding up and stuff and like in my mind I was like do you mind if I tape record this ma'am <laughs> you know? could you give me a or two <laughs> you know I have I have this face right and people love to talk to me and I think it's because I'm I'm interested in hearing their stories you know and so like people will get on an elevator and blurt out their life story. Um, and I love it. And I think that it's a gift as a writer to, to want to hear people's stories and, and to listen well. And um, so that's how I got the idea for that book that, um, that Rachel would have this lovely life. She, um, the person sitting next to me in Chili's had twins. I gave Rachel triplets. And, um, and I just thought like, what do you do when your life is so happy and it's everything you ever wanted? And then you find out that your husband is cheating on you. Um, do you try? Do you think, well, my daughters are three, what am I gonna do, you know? Um, so it was a really interesting problem to, to explore. Mm -hmm. um, was that your favorite origin story? This is one of my questions um, <laughs> of all of your books. Because I, I mean, you, you, talk, you talk a lot about the what sparks. Yeah, that was definitely a very um, tragic origin story because you don't want to see somebody hurting so badly that she'll just like vomit up her her problems to a total stranger. Um, so you know, I mean, it was it certainly made me start to think about that situation. Um, but um, I think my favorite origin story is is the one with my cousin passing me on the highway and me thinking. I'll write a priest because <laughs> <You know? laughs> it just everything just fell into place and by the way I did give him a copy of the book he's probably 10 years older than I am and I put you know to Barry the only priest I've ever had a crush on and he read it and he said he was crying with laughter because so much of it was true you know all these women who have crushes on the unattainable man you know mm -hmm. Um, the paragon who will not date them in most <laughs> cases. 
<laughs> well, he was also such a good person. Like you would want to be married to somebody like that. Well, you know, it's safe, right? Mm. You think like, I'll have a crush on the priest because he's off limits and I'm never going to get entangled and, and my heart broken unless he leaves the priesthood. <laughs> <laughs> which, which I'm, I don't know if everybody's read all of the books, but you know, we'll see what happens with him. <laughs> I love that you actually, um, I was going to say that I thought that um, The Best Man started your first series, but now I realize you've actually written three Gideon Cove books. I mean, it's actually, you've, um, you've, you've, and life and, uh, and other inconveniences. So like you've kept your readers really happy and staying in those worlds. Yeah, um, I think Blue Heron is the true series in that I wrote, you know, a book about a town and these five people in the town finding love. Um, the other books are, I consider connected. Um, so I had written um, Catch of the Day and then I wrote The Next Best Thing and they have nothing to do with each other. But then when I wrote Somebody to Love, I took a character from the next best thing. And I brought her to Gideon's Cove from Catch of the Day. So um, you see these characters, you know, like Parker who writes books, wait, is that Parker from the next best thing? And wait a minute, she runs into a hot fisherman named Malone, you know, um, we know this guy. So they're connected and the same with um, uh, life and other inconveniences and always the last to know. Um, uh, Cambrian Hudson was in uh, on second thought if you only knew and good luck with that mm -hmm. so um, they're not like all my books are standalones um, each one can be read whenever you want but um, those those connected books are more like what we call easter eggs for the reader to come across and say like oh they live down the street from Leo I loved Leo you know um, and oh, Leo. Leo was so tortured. I felt so bad for him. Another widower. Yeah, but you wrote him so amazingly, you know, like you felt for him. Like you do all of your characters. You just write people that that we just want to be best friends with oh, and okay. also are afraid to be with because you're like, oh my God, there's so much they have such history. You know what? I just in talking about this, I realized I got my own title wrong. Um, Rachel is from uh, if you only knew. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> okay. um, well, I'm vindicated. <laughs> Thank you for that, Kristen. Um, I did want to let everybody know that I had a filter on my uh, on my um, Zoom that put on my lipstick, and now and it was uh, like all over the place, so I took it off. It was. It looked like she was getting kissed by like a ghost with lipstick on. It was really. I was like, oh, wait, oh, look, look at those lips. They're so cute. I didn't know that such a filter was possible. So I. Well, uh, apparently it's not. <laughs> <laughs> Use at your own risk. That's right. Exactly. If you want to look like you know a pockmarked whatever, but. Um, <laughs> Um, okay, so I'm going to say I loved the best man, and whoever came up with that title is a genius. Was it you? There you yeah. go. <laughs> You're a genius. It was probably is a very easy, you know, title. It certainly lent itself um, to the story. Mm -hmm. um, it did. It was perfect. It did, it took me a while to realize it was a double entendre, and then yeah. I was like, oh, genius. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, uh, did you did you uh, plot that out as a five book series? No, I told my my editor. I, you know, they, uh, my readers had been saying, please write a series. We love your towns. We love your characters. And they would ask like, can you write a story for Bruce? And I'm like, I don't, I don't think, I think you have the wrong author. And then it turns out like, no, Bruce is, you know, the guy who stood Maggie up um, in the first night she had a date with Mon. Um, and I'm like, oh, <laughs> Bruce, right. Um, but, but it was such a compliment to say, like, we want to stay in these towns that you write and and visit with these people. So I thought, all right, I'll give it a shot. And um, uh, so I cast about for the structure of of this series, what would hold this series together. And I thought a family owned business, um, 
And I had already written a, a bakery, a family run bakery. And uh, in that same story, uh, an Italian restaurant. So I had dessert and dinner. And so I went to wine and, um, and I didn't know it at the time, but the Finger Lakes region of New York, which I had never heard of, um, is uh, in Western New York. And there are these very deep, like seven or eight lakes. Um, and they have very steep hillsides and the depths of the lakes and the steepness of the hillsides are like magic for grape growing. Mm -hmm. And um, so I wrote to like the chamber of commerce up there. I'm like, hi, I'm a New York Times bestselling author. I was gonna set a series up here. Can you recommend some places for me to visit? And she did, I mean, she, she gave me this whole like carte blanche to all these vineyards. And um, one vineyard like put me up in a hotel for a few days. And, and um, so the Holland family is based on the Fulkerson family in, um, in the Finger Lakes region and Dundee, New York. And John Holland is based on the patriarch Sayer Fulkerson. It was just so perfect. You know, like you have a picture in your mind of, of what your characters will be like or what the the little vineyard tasting room will look like. And it was like walking into my imagination. It was so cool. And um, the only thing that didn't fit was the town because I wanted like a tiny little town with a green and a couple of restaurants. And, and um, Dundee was sort of like a, a drive through town with mm -hmm. one road. And so we just went tooling around and then we just happened upon Hammondsport, New York which became Manningsport in the book series. Um, so I'm mouthing the words as you say them. <laughs> <laughs> Manningsport. <laughs> Manningsport, named after Eli Manning. Um, it was the year that they the Giants beat the uh, Patriots for the first time in the Super Bowl. Um, that's why I <laughs> look at her face. <laughs> that's why I'm trying I not to be that. judgmental, trying not to be. <laughs> So, um, so I knew that I would do the, the three Holland grown children, Faith, Honor, and Jack. Um, I, I thought it would be a three book series. And then I, I invented the O'Rourke twins and I loved them so much, Colleen and Connor. So I wrote Faith's story and then Honor's story. And then it was time for Jack's story. And I thought Jack feels very fraternal to me right now like I don't I need a break from him before I can think of him as a hot guy right and um and so I went to the twins and um wrote Colleen's story which is a riff on Cyrano de Bergerac and Emma um and uh and then I um went back to Jack and then the final book is Connor mm -hmm. and I felt like you know, a lot of people say, will you write another Blue Heron? And it's one of those like never say never things. But I did feel that it was a very complete series, mm -hmm. you know, that there was nobody left hanging. I didn't want to like be cheap and invent a street like around the corner in this town of 600 people. There's a family with six hot brothers and no one's <laughs> married, you know. So I felt like that was cheating. Um, and And like everybody that I had introduced found a partner and um, lived happily ever after. <laughs> that would be like um, if in, was it, uh, oh, just one of the guys. That was my first book that I read by, by you. And where, um, where if you had gone with the entire, like, you know, department that you worked in or something. Right, right. <laughs> Every you know, firefighter. Other authors have done that and, and more power to them, but it, like in that book, Chastity has four brothers. Two of them are happily married. Um, one of them is unhappily married and um, and the other does get together with somebody in the course of the book. So I sort of blew my chance at her four older brothers having stories too. But I didn't, at the time, I just didn't want to write a series. I didn't feel like an experienced enough author. I mm. think. Really? Because that that put me on a serious like uh Kristen Higgins is my I just I mean everything she's written and I know it was like your not your maybe your second or third book but I was just it like was oh, my third book yeah, yeah. It. I'm following Kristen Higgins yeah. um so I want to go back a little bit because on Facebook Becky asks do you have a favorite blue hair and character and or book 
Oh, the um, children. Um, I think that the best man is my favorite, probably because it was it was so new. But if I think hard enough about each one of them, they're all my favorite. You know, it's like it's like your kids; um, they rotate in your mm -hmm. favor. Um, <laughs> but I, the best man, I loved the setup of Faith all set to marry a guy who comes out on their wedding day um, <laughs> after the ceremony has started at the prompting of the best man who has always suspected that he was gay. And, um, you know, just says like, Jeremy, you can't do this, you know? And poor Jeremy is like white faced and clammy. And um, so I loved that idea that faith has only been in love once and it's with a gay guy who is damn perfect, right? I mean, we all love Jeremy and, um, and that she blames Levi Cooper, the best man, for ruining everything. You know, like, couldn't you have kept your mouth shut and kept him in the closet? We could have had some kind of happiness. You know? <laughs> Just 10 more minutes. <laughs> I know. <laughs> you see it. <laughs> so, um, so my favorite character, I think, would have to be Prue, Prudence, mm. the older sister, um, the menopausal older sister girl power, hot flash sisterhood here. Um, she is um, trying to reinvigorate her, her love life with her husband, Carl, who never speaks in any of the books, which is, you know, half his charm is that he never speaks. Um, and she overshares tremendously. And, um, you know, is always telling her siblings about the latest um, misadventure in the bedroom or bikini wax gone wrong. And, um, so how could you not love that woman? <laughs> and yet be terrified of like running into somebody like her. <laughs> right. So Becky says that that was um, the best scene for her was uh, Faith's escape from the bathroom. And Stephanie says that just one of the guys was her first also. Oh. And so I'm going to go back to just one of the guys because I was really mad at just one of the guys because I didn't understand why Trevor at the end changed like all along throughout the book he was he was like I can't do this I can't do this I can't do this and then at the end he changed his mind and I realized that I don't usually read books in first person because that is hard for me yeah. but um I was just wondering like from you know like if you look back and you think what was going on with Trevor can you just explain that to me <laughs> so Trevor is um the like her her fifth brother um, mm -hmm. except she's loved him since she was 12. And um, he is best friend of two of her brothers. He is godfather to several of her nieces and nephews. And um, he worships her dad, who is the captain of the fire department. And Trevor is a firefighter. Um, and so chastity is off limits to him. They hook up in college and and then he start. Then su her brother surprises uh, Trevor by visiting. Like, hey, I thought we could hang out this weekend. And and you know, here he has just deflowered Mark's younger sister, and um, so he's he's horrified. And then Chastity thinks about all that Trevor has to lose if their relationship doesn't work out. He loses his whole family of choice because his own family fell apart. His sister died. His parents divorced. And so if their relationship doesn't work out, where is he going to go on Thanksgiving? Who's he going to talk to? What if her father like hates him for breaking his baby girl's heart? So she understands like his terror and cuts him loose, but never gets over him. And so when she comes back to town, um, I think that all those things are still in place for Trevor, but um, throughout the course of the book, you know, she's like, okay, I've waited long enough. I've pined over him long enough. I'm going to find somebody else. And she does. She finds Dr. Darling um, and Ryan Darling, and he's really good on paper and he really likes her. And like, she has nothing to criticize about him. And I think for Trevor, it's when he sees that Chastity is going to marry someone else. And, um, you know, what is his 
what is that going to be like for him? Is that going to be worse? You know, he doesn't want to break up her relationship, but you know, he suddenly has this change of heart at the idea of her being with somebody else. Mm -hmm. Oh, so that was the trigger for him. Well, yeah. And then she also has this killer line at her mother's wedding when they're dancing together. And, uh, it just spurs him into a great grand gesture. <laughs> and do you remember what that line was? Um, he says, uh, why aren't you marrying Dr. Perfect? And she starts to think of some glib answer. And she says, he, he wasn't you. Just like that, you know? And uh, so they realize, you know, there's only one person for them and they're staring each other in the face. <laughs> I bawled. I really <laughs> cried. <at> that one. <laughs> I know. So you make me cry a lot. I'm, I'm not sure if I'm thankful for that or not, but <laughs> it's kind of my thing, you know, I, I do. My tagline is laugh, cry, laugh again. Mm -hmm. um, I, I do like to provide the full emotional experience um, for readers because that's what I like to read. You know, mm -hmm. I like to, to, to be tossed about on the stormy seas of someone fictional person's life, you know, and so I don't want to read a book that I'll forget the next day. I don't want to read a book that is, you know, pretty good. I want to read a book that like grabs me by the heart and shakes me around and drops me and steps on me and then... <laughs> picks me up and takes me somewhere lovely and happy. You know, I want that whole, that whole range of feelings. So yeah, I hope you'll cry if you read my books. I, I'm kind of proud of it. <laughs> and I cry writing them. I want you to know I sob, um, you know, sometimes I like surrounded by tissues, just, you know, this pack up the moon was, was a very emotional book to write and some really, you know, gritty, sad scenes. And I was just wrecked. <laughs> but I do, I did also like, I, when I finished that book, I felt like the epilogue was so perfect and so beautiful. And I really felt like changed, you know, for having written it, for having gotten Joshua through this tragedy of his wife's death and brought him to a place where a, a beautiful, love-filled, future is waiting for him i just can sigh so <laughs> you know which book i really cried it was um i'm not gonna remember the title of course but it was the one where um she married the brother the italian restaurant and the yeah he died that was, um the next best thing the next best thing and when she realized what he had done her husband who died and i just was crushed. I was so crushed. Yeah, that, that was, um, that was a really fun story to write too, in that um, I, I remember I was like, oh, I have no more ideas. My career is over, which is part <laughs> of the course. Um, but back then I didn't know it and I believed it. So I, I had gone for a run. This is how long ago it was when I was still running, um, when my knees still worked. And, um, and I, I thought like, well, I guess I'll, I haven't written a widow. I, I could write a widow. And I thought, well, who would be the worst person for a widow to fall for? And I immediately thought his brother. Mm. Um, so this is the story of, of Lucy. Um, and, uh, and she, she is very young and she has a friend at college named Ethan and Ethan lives in the same town as she does. And he brings her into the restaurant one day and there's his brother, his older brother, Jimmy, the chef. And she just falls completely in love with Jimmy and they get married. And, and then Jimmy dies in a car accident. And um, so meanwhile, Ethan has been like the faithful brother-in-law and friend to her. And he takes such good care of her. And they're so devoted to each other. And then you find at the end of chapter one, they're also sleeping together, <laughs> you know, but it's like a secret. We're just friends with benefits, but you know, now it's time for us to put that behind us and look forward to a more serious relationship. Um, and I think her breakthrough moment in that story and 
um, her own grand gesture is one of the best that I've written. I thought it was um, really powerful and beautiful and sad and wonderful. Um, so yeah, I was really proud of that book. I love that book. I love that whole story. And, you know, again, crying. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so I had mentioned this question to you that um, you had said that Pack Up the Moon is one of the most important books you've ever written. And I had said, for me, it was good luck with that. Totally mm-hmm. changed how I look at myself and feel about you know, how you look at yourself through a lens and mm-hmm. expect everybody else to see you that same way. Um, so I'm, and you know, people have different reactions and I'm wondering what were some of the best things you've heard about your various books from your readers about which ones had impacted them the most? Well, um, I do, I get a lot of mail from people who are reading my books during a sad time because they're you know, the earlier books are, are really funny. And, you know, I think all my books have really funny scenes in them. Um, for I've gotten more fan mail for good luck with that than any other book um, because it is about self-acceptance and body image and especially weight in an American female, on three American females and how, how hard it is to love yourself in a celebrity obsessed society where you see photoshopped pictures of, you know, unrealistic people, um, you know, and, and you measure yourself against them and how damaging that is and how exhausting it is. And then we're also a society obsessed with food, right? So we love food, we love bad food, donuts and fast food and cheeseburgers and, you know, all that delicious stuff and um so we have these two messages going on and I think that book really struck a chord with with the you know the readership of as you said like you see yourself through the lens of am I as pretty as Beyonce <laughs> you know? no none of us is. um and Beyonce isn't yeah and um and and how can you make peace with your imperfections and really focus on what's good about you? So that I do think that that was a very important book and thank you for saying that. Um, Pack Up the Moon, um, I've gotten a tremendous amount of, of letters and fan mail about it because you know this is a book about surviving loss and every human is going to have to survive loss. And it's almost a blueprint for how to do it. And it's also, in my opinion, a blueprint for a happy marriage. I wrote this book um, knowing that my daughter would be marrying her then boyfriend. Um, it came out three days after their wedding. And, um, you know, so to, to be writing about newlyweds when your daughter is on that path, it, it was very profound for me. And, um, and, you know, the worst thing happens to this couple. One of them dies and the other is left alone after, you know, redefining his whole life because he's a husband and so proud and so happy and so good at being a husband. And now he's not. And um, I've heard from so many widows and widowers who see themselves in Josh and who remember that and say like, I felt, I felt like you were looking at the world through my eyes and and it was just so good to know that I wasn't alone in that and that other people have gone through this and gotten to the other side and um, one person wrote to me I you know I'm not widowed I, I'm divorced but um but m- your book is making me think like maybe it's time for me to open my heart and and not be resigned to the fact that you know I'm going to be alone forever maybe it's time to to open up and blossom a little bit. And so I think, you know, those books are, I, I think I by the end of a year, I will say the Pack Up the Moon has just as much fan mail as, as good luck with that. Um, and, you know, I, I, um, I, I think all of my books are important from the fluffiest one, which was probably just one of the guys. Um, I'm going to say, you know, Catch of the Day, just one of the guys very, light and fun and and filled with laughter and hopefully a few tears but um as I've 
grown as a writer and, and you know, I've been doing this now for 18 years. Um, I, I've, I'm more courageous about getting into the more difficult emotions and the more difficult messages. You know, it's not just about this great gal trying to find a great guy, you know, and I don't, I'm not disparaging romance. I love romance. I read a lot of it. I, I have loved writing it and, and may write it again. Um, but in, in women's fiction, it's a little bit more about um, the journey of the person and a relationship is part of that. It's not like a, my goal is to get somebody. It's like my goal is to fix these problems. And in the course of that, I might find somebody. Mm -hmm. um, and then in Pack Up the Moon, which is my first general fiction book, um, because it's told largely from Joshua's point of view, um, you know, it's, it's, Joshua getting through it. So it's it's a man, Ladlet, I guess you could call it. <laughs> <Whatever women call. laughs> I've never heard that. I think you should uh I'm gonna trademark that. Yeah, I was gonna say <laughs> it's a copyright thing. Um so Sharon says, I haven't even read Pack Up the Moon yet, and my throat is tight and well, might need a towel and not a tissue. <laughs> <laughs> and I would say, Sharon, that you are absolutely right. Not just one of those little towels, like a big bath sheet. <laughs> Don't skimp on the towel. I, you, you will cry reading it. Um, some people have said like, oh, you know, I, I sniveled a little. And then other people were like, I had to lie down. I was crying so hard. My, my husband called 911. Um, <laughs> you know, but um, it, you know, it's meant to, to go there. And again, like I, I like to explore those difficult issues and certainly death is one of them, especially the death of a young person. And especially when you know it's coming, terminal illness in a young person is something most of us don't want to look at. Um, and when we're presented with that, we're like, well, I will pray for you. And maybe, you know, there'll be a miracle drug and you don't want to hear about the, you know, the other outcome, which is death. Um, so, I um, I wanted to explore what it's like to live with a terminal illness and and also how to live joyfully with that because that's the the premise of the book is Lauren is her life is coming to a close she knows that she feels it and it has been the best year of her life and um, and she she feels like more herself almost like burnished to gold by this illness um, and, and also devastated that she's going to break her husband's heart. So she writes these letters to guide him through that first year of widowhood to help him walk the path that he would be reluctant to walk unless she was bossing him around from beyond the grave. <laughs> I love how she's like, honey. <laughs> Um, so Stephanie says that her mom, who's in the green shirt, says chapter 35 is when to break out the towel. So you have a little time, Sharon. <laughs> Be prepared. Right? <laughs> also on my, on my Facebook group, also known as the chapter. <laughs> like I was fine until the chapter. <laughs> so on Facebook, Debbie says, my son has Asperger's and I really identified with some of the social challenges Josh had. Did you do research on that? Because, and I, I picked, I wanted to ask this question for a while because um, when I saw you on Sunday, you had an amazing story to tell about this. Did I, Mina? <laughs> You've been in a lot of interviews recently. Can you give me a hint? It was, um, a, it was about um, the researcher that contacted you um, about Josh, wasn't it? Like somebody had contacted you and said, this is really like so oh now I've spoiled it I don't remember exactly what it well, was I I did um reach out to a, a few men who were very high functioning on um the spectrum or neurodiverse I'm I'm not the words change fast so I don't mean offense if I say autistic or a spectrum um but uh I I found some some gentlemen who were willing to talk to me and I really wanted the male perspective of it I don't know if it was different but writing from a man's point of view I wanted a man's point of view and um and it was really wonderful I I also read a bunch of articles um about being married to someone on the spectrum um and about um 
not realizing how you come. There was a wonderful article about um, written by a, a man who wrote an article about autism and realized in the course of his research that he was autistic as well. <laughs> and he never knew, you know, he because I think in a generation, our understanding of being on the spectrum has just exploded so much. So like when I grew up, you might say like, well, that kid's weird. And, you know, he's not very good at talking to people and he maybe was on the spectrum and we didn't know. Um, now we have the words and the, you know, measures and the sensitivity to it. Mm -hmm. So um, in writing about Josh, I did draw from the guys, I mentioned them in the acknowledgements. Um, one thing in particular um, was Joshua's temper and he gets what he calls the red out. So he's a very level-headed guy, very calm 90, 95% of the time. But when something goes wrong, he just kind of, he says, you know, the red rises and, um, and he will, you know, like he, he punches a guy who threatens his friend and he, um, uh, he, he has to like when, when he's a kid and his mom is taken away for an emergency appendectomy, he goes a little crazy and like people have to hold him down. And, um, and that was really, really interesting to me. Um, you know, that, that he had to find a way to, to get a grip on that. So he takes up boxing um, and um, his neighbor, Ben, teaches him to box. And, and so he has a, a punching bag around. Um, the other things about like his social awkwardness, they were really, I loved writing Josh because Josh is an entire person. You know, Lauren loves him exactly as he is. And it's not like we need to fix you because you're on the spectrum. It's just, this is how you are mm -hmm. and I'll help you. And, you know, um, you know, that first chapter after she's died, he's thinking Lauren would know what to do at her funeral. She would tell me how to respond to people. And, you know, he gets fixated on, on this small thing. And, you know, his mother's like jabbing him with her mm -hmm. elbow. Um, but that's something that I was really proud of in writing this book is that Joshua's Asperger's is not a flaw at all. It's just part of his character, you know? And I think we need to see more of those kind of characters. I know um, Helen Huang's The Kiss Quotient did a really nice job with that as well. Um, and um, yeah, there's there's been a few, but Helen Huang's was was really remarkable. And she herself is, is on the spectrum. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, yeah, he was really delightful to write. And I'm gonna just say it, I love him so much. <laughs> Just love Josh so much. I will never get over you, Joshua Park. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think a lot of us will. <laughs> so I remember what it was. Is didn't you become friends with somebody who maybe had lost his wife, and now you, then you started writing letters? Yeah, that happened after the book came out, um, and that was really beautiful. So uh, this guy was just randomly going through pictures um, on his wife's computer. She died in in March, and he found a picture of her with me when I was in Kansas City on book tour a couple of years ago. And she gave me a, this little um, copper sculpture with some stones in it in the shape of a seahorse because she knew I, I go to Cape Cod all the time. And I, I um, so he just sent me this and he said, you know, I don't know if you remember, but you met my wife, Bridget, and she loved your books. And I'm sorry to say she passed away in March. And I just thought you'd like to have this photo. And I was like, oh my gosh, I, I remember her. That's hanging in our house on the Cape. Um, and, you know, she was so lovely. I was so touched that she took the time to make me a present. And, um, and I said, it's ironic. Um, the, the book I, I, that just came out is about a widower who lost his wife. And I'd love to send you a copy in Bridget's memory but you might not want to read it right now. And, um, and he said, Oh, that, that would be so great. You know, like this is the first time I've been able to talk about Bridget with anyone, but the kids. And um, so I sent him the book and he started to read it. And he's like, Oh my gosh, this is just like Bridget and me. I see so much of Bridget and me in there. And in fact, she had written him a note the last time before she went into the hospital and it, he sent it to me and it was so beautiful and you know you just think like 
the kind of courage that it takes to write to your spouse a maybe goodbye note because you don't know how this is going to end. It was, it was beautiful. And I'm really happy to say that her husband loves the book and just feels very validated by it, you know, and I think like widowhood is something that does kind of close down your world. Um, and, and my own mom was widowed young and, you know, I just remember like her world getting smaller and smaller, not just because my dad was gone, but because you become a little bit of an oddity mm. in your society when you're young like that. So the idea that, that this book helped this gentleman and like we're pen pals now and obviously he I said you need to visit the Cape you know um with your kids and I will definitely have dinner all of us it'll be great you can meet my daughter and son-in-law and husband and all that stuff um so that's just like the power of of books on people is that you find these connections just by being a book lover and a reader that you, you might not have found otherwise. Mm -hmm. And not just with my books, but, you know, you know, I made a friend in a bookstore selling, um, a, they have this local author day. And so the local authors go and shill books and you're supposed <laughs> to shill your own, but I was shilling Kristen Hannah's The Nightingale. Which I don't think is you have to shill book. her books. <laughs> yeah, it's really easy to shill her books. And um, is that the right word, shill? That's the totally right word. Okay. I was thinking shiv, that's the wrong word. Uh, <laughs> so anyway, I was shilling Kristen's books and um, and I made a friend over some like, oh my God, I read that book too. I finished it at three in the morning. I, was, I finished it at 3.30 in the morning. And, um, you know, we were just talking about it and we ended up getting coffee afterwards. And now we're friends <laughs> because we loved the same book. So that's just like the beautiful world of being a reader. Mm -hmm. That's right. And we see it in libraries all the time where, you know, people come in and they're like, oh my gosh, um, especially when an author does visit and then they connect, they might not have known that they liked each other's that same book, but then they realize it when they see each other at a, an author visit. Um, mm -hmm. Chelsea is now crying, but before she started crying, she said, she asked, what led you to write Pack Up the Moon? And I remember you talking about that scene where you at the beach. Yeah. Yeah. So I was struggling to finish Always the Last to Know because it was a terrible book, you know, and I it was never going to be as good as my last one. Same old refrain. And so I had given myself like a month to, um, to finish it. And so I rented a house, my, our own little family cottage was closed. So I rented a house that was right on the beach in February on Cape Cod. And it was so inspiring just to be around the wild winter ocean. And it was freezing cold one day. And I had my dog Luther who is collapsed at my side, um, like the good dog that he is snoring gently away. Um, I, I had to take Luther out for his little daily um, stroll and it was so cold and I was wearing this bright pink parka and like three hats and my eyes were streaming and Luther doesn't have he's not doesn't have thick fur and he was shivering in his little coat I'm like hurry up, hurry up let's get home before we die you know and um and I see this guy in the distance and he's standing at the water's edge and he's it looked like he was wearing a windbreaker or something he was not bundled up the way I was and he didn't even have a hat on and the wind is wicked up there in the winter, you know, and he just staring out to sea. And I just, I saw him and I just thought he looks like the loneliest man in the world right now. And he didn't, you know, turn his head. He didn't, we didn't catch his eye, even though I was in bright pink or anything. So I didn't strike up a conversation with him. I thought I want to write his story and I, I want to write about this loneliest man and redeem him and bring him into the fold and feel loved again you know mm. so sometimes it's you know that stranger on a train who's sobbing on the phone and sometimes it's just a glimpse of something um I know Susan Elizabeth Phillips who has a wonderful book out this week called When Stars Collide she said um she has this file of useless ideas that we writers keep um you know for when we're desperate and she was desperate and she opened up this file and it only had two words in it, opera singer. And she's like, I'm going to, I'm going to do that. I'm going to write about an opera singer mm -hmm. and, um, and a football player, because it's part of the Chicago stars, uh, 
legendary series. <laughs> and, um, and that was enough, just those two words, like the whole book unfolded in front of her. So sometimes, I mean, that's so great when it happens. And, and then sometimes you think like, yeah, that's a great idea. And it, it doesn't go anywhere. So you have to throw it out and start something else and find something else that really interests you at the time. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to ask just one more question. Um, I don't see any more on Facebook or here. So I'm going to ask mine, which okay. is, um, we got into a little bit of a Twitter thing today, <laughs> you and I, and you had mentioned that you like to talk about your bad dating scenes. Yeah. So just to end, which one was your favorite bad dating scene and why? There's so many to choose from. I, I do love to write a date gone wrong scene. <laughs> Um, and I, I mean, I think I do them very well. And, um, I'm going to say that in, um, too good to be true. Um, uh, Grace goes on a date with a guy. Um, he said he was 40 and she's in her thirties, but he's like 70. <laughs> and she said, but you said you were 40. And he said, I was 40 months, <laughs> but um, he, he's like, he doesn't have a leg. And I think there may be something wrong with his eyes injured in Vietnam and Grace is a history teacher. So she knows the battle that he was at and it was a horrible battle. So she ends up spending like three hours with the guy cause she just can't bear to say, I'm sorry, you misled me and I'm not gonna be your girlfriend. <laughs> so, you know. So I, I really do enjoy like those really uncomfortable and yet you can't get out of it date scenes. Well, your female characters are always so nice too. They always tend or seem to find something good about the person. Right, um, right. You know, like who was, who was the one that went out with that professor Drago or? Oh yeah, truck. My mom's favorite character, Drug Dragul. <laughs> um, yeah, the, uh, the guy who sounds like Dracula. Yeah. Um, yeah, and she just can't, you know, say out loud, like, this isn't going to work. I admire the people who can do that, who can sit down and say, I'm sorry, I can already tell, you know, just like the way you're eating your food, it's not going to work, <laughs> or, um, you know. Um, one of my friends um, ordered a drink and the guy left because she was drinking Merlot. And he thought that that was a sign of like being shallow and not knowing enough about the grape. And she's like, <laughs> Sit, you know, don't let the door hit you on the way out. <laughs> so I, I do love um, uh, women who in real life can just say, sorry, no, this won't work for me. But in my books, it's much more fun to torture them. <laughs> you certainly did. And I go back to Maggie in, um... Maggie had a lot of great bad dates. Remember she, the guy pops a hernia at bowling. <laughs> had to be one of my favorites. <laughs> Which was the one where the mom was on the dating site the same time they were, and oh, they yeah. were getting lots of dates, constant pain. Yeah, that was uh, just one of the guys. The mom was a hot yes. commodity and chastity is text uh, emailing with this guy who seemed really great. And it turns out to be her brother. <laughs> So, yeah, and I did, I have to say that in Pack Up the Moon, I love Joshua's bad date, um, which is actually kind of a, a nice date, except there's one critical piece of information missing, um, not to spoil it, but um, yeah, he, he, uh, he's having a wonderful time until. <laughs> that was so funny. And again, it's that laugh, cry, laugh right. thing that you do. And you just can't believe that you pulled it off every single time. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Kristen. This has been fantastic. Oh, yeah, my pleasure. I, I love Mina. I love the library. I can't wait for our sleep over there. Um, I believe I was promised certain things in exchange for this talk. The <laughs> Ashland Library is so gorgeous. And um, I said to Mina, can I sleep over there? Like, can we, can we have a slumber party? Um, but yeah, thank you for tuning in guys. And if you're an Ashland patron, I hope to see you in person next time. And uh, don't forget to support Bank Street Books. Right, I'll put the link and, and I'll send it out in a recap as well. But can I just ask really quick before we go completely yeah. is 
are you working on something right now? And can you tell us anything about it? Um, I am always working on a new book. Um, and uh, I'm not really good at talking about them until they're formulated. But I will say it's a book about um, two very different sisters on Cape Cod. And there's um, some very well justified rage and insanity in it, you know, like I was driven to this point. Damn it. <laughs> so, so I'm having fun. Right <laughs> That's all. I'm sorry to put you on the spot, but I was like, oh, I've seen you write something about this. Um, <laughs> um, again, sure. yes. Thank you. Thank you everybody for being here. And like I said, I'll send out the link for Banks Word Books. And um, Kristen, I look forward to seeing you in person someday. And thank you so much for your books, which make I just look forward to every single year. Thank you. Thanks. It was great to be here. And yes, we'll have to get together in person soon. That's right. <laughs> Thanks, Thanks everybody. everybody. <laughs>